Good morning, Mr. Mazza. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Joseph Mazza for Ronald McCoy. The quickest way to reduce confidence in convictions is by ignoring jury impartiality. Before emphasizing the complaint issue, we would try to quickly note the initial problem was a substantial fraction of the veneer showing a likelihood of predisposition. What in this case, what was unusual about the responses of the Suffolk County jury to the questions? I mean, from my memory when I sat in Suffolk County, it would not be at all unusual that so many people would raise their hands that they were victims of a violent, they or their family members were victims of a violent crime. Yet you seem to make the argument that this was an unusual case because so many people raised their hands and therefore we should have extra peremptories. Well, we have 30 saying that they are victims of family members. We have an additional- Out of how many? Do we know how many were in the courtroom altogether? That's not on the record, no. No. So if you want to envision a typical veneer, in Commonwealth v. August, the language is a substantial fraction of the full veneer. And because the August and Susie case is going to come- I don't understand what, I didn't, I don't know what you mean, a substantial fraction. What are you talking about? Right. Well, I don't have the denominator. But we have those 30, we have an additional six who answered the questionnaire. Yes, but in a Suffolk County jury pool, it is not at all unusual to have 30 people raise their hands that they are a family member or victims of a violent crime. Or that six people, so that what, why, what I'm saying is if this case, I don't see why this case cries out that the judge abuses discretion in saying no, you can't have any more than the normal number of peremptories. Okay. What we're saying is that there's a reasonable request for two additional, at least two additional strikes. And we, you know, we do think that's reasonable given the, see, the predisposition of that veneer- Well, first off, we don't know how many people are in the venire. We can't, we have no basis even for making an argument. It could be 30 out of 40 people, and it could be 30 out of 200. My guess is it's more like 150, but I don't know. And 30 out of 150 would be a very normal number. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not a reasonable request. It's a very reasonable request, but why does the judge abuse his discretion by saying no, this is just a normal case. Yes, a lot of people, unfortunately today, are victims of violent crimes or family members. Okay. What we're showing is that there are candidates, hands up with good faith candidates for strikes who are going into deliberation. Okay. To me, that's the most prejudice you can show. And also on any of the candidates, the people we've signaled, we're not saying that any one of them was erroneously seated. We're just saying they're showing a likelihood of predisposition sufficient to warrant a strike. Why is it a likelihood? There are probably many of those victims whose cases were never prosecuted, and they're darn mad at the police that nothing, and the DA's office, that nothing happened in their case. But so I don't, I don't know how you get to the next step that says because they were a victim, they're biased in favor of the commonwealth. See, then if we don't know that, we don't even know if we should be striking them. Well, so, but so I'm saying, so how do you make, how do you make the assumption that because they were a victim of a violent crime, they're going to be biased in favor of the commonwealth, which is the assumption that you're making? Or that there's a likelihood of bias sufficient to warrant a strike. That's all we need, and that's all we're saying. Okay, but here there was no motion to strike anybody for cause, correct? There was, there was, there was no motion to strike any juror for cause. No, there were no for-cause challenges. So whoever got on then was apparently somebody who there was no cause to remove. In the District of Columbia, I understand that a crime victim is removed for cause, and I don't think that there's a motion. But you didn't even move for cause here. I know that. The judge was never, you never said to the judge, this juror cannot be fair, you should remove him for cause. Right. 
There are there so why are should no the judge give you more peremptories if there's not even a claim that any that, that a single juror out of this veneer is removable for cause? Well, see, peremptories are, you know, distinctly different from the four cause challenge. And the four cause challenge is not a, a, an aspect of preservation. It's, it, it's a completely different, we've, uh, uh, I think it was Lewis v. United States, uh, which attributes the notion to Joseph Story and the, who initially quoted Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that they Blackstone. are different, but I guess the question is you're yeah. essentially alleging that due process was denied your client because of an abuse of discretion of the judge and not giving you more no. peremptory. <coughs> there are two parts. There is no a constitutional aspect to peremptory strikes. There is no constitutional guarantee. In fact, expressly, they are set up outside of rights. However, there is a constitutional uh, right under Morgan v. Illinois to sufficient voir dire questioning and uh, as being part and partial of, uh, part and part of, the, of the impartial jury trial right. That aspect pertains to the curative strike. So when we have so few strikes, we used three off the bat. One of those strikes was a curative strike for a rape victim whom the trial court refuses to ask, declines to ask, was there a prosecution? What was the result of the prosecution, if any? And with an able prosecutor also wanting to know what was the reaction of the rape victim? Okay. But, but you didn't need to use a peremptory challenge for that person. You could have at least tried first to use a, a, a challenge for cause. Well, the um, defense counsel had done all but set up pyrotechnics in, in the courtroom on that one. You'll, you'll see like uh, he's going on for a page and a half trying to get the judge to just ask the questions. And um, I think there would have been no point. That's the curative strike, and that's the, the Susie and, okay. and, and the Gus. Could, could we turn to the first complaint issues when you're there? Sure. Um, I, I take it there was no objections to what's being complained about now, is that right? True. Either, either the mother or, the, or, the, or Nurse Dyson? Is that right? True. Um, so it's your position, uh, as the appeals court uh, concluded, that at least in combination, but I take it particularly the nurse, created a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor, that, that is exactly the petition, our position. The, the uh, testimony is extensive, elaborating on the details of the complaint. And that would be well, the mother did as well, didn't she? She said that um, the police officer told me my daughter had been raped. And, um. But it, it, that, it wasn't as extensive <coughs> as, as the... Uh, no, but I'm saying the mother additionally well, piled yes. it on. Yes. Mr. Mazzo, turning to the nurse's testimony, why is that not admissible as an excited utterance? Okay, we're, we're maintaining that that's not even close. She has three motives to fabricate and she has time for reflection. Previously, she's been in to, at, at the f first complaint, and she's given her uh, answered questions as to her name, age, uh, street address, apartment number, telephone number, the location of the alleged event, and the um, manner of the alleged event. Okay, now all of a sudden, it's, and it's about a, probably an hour and a quarter later. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Two hours. That's what the record says. Okay. She. Do we know how long the interview was? With, with, with the, the police nurse? or the nurse? With the nurse. Uh, not the interview, but she's at the hospital for three hours. But well, we don't I know don't how know, long. In other answer. words, she's in the ER first. Mm -hmm. Do, do we know what her personal condition was, what, uh, how she was reacting 
Uh, was she still under the influence of, of, of the alleged rape at the time that the SANE interview conducted the, ner the interview? Okay, we don't, our position would be that she's not excited. Well, no, 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 but I mean, what, what does the nurse say about, about her, uh, uh, her, her okay. affect? She is labile, meaning uh, she goes from, uh, in fact, I, Changeable. Yeah. Went from being it's, really it, angry. It, it's, it's not stable. She's going from uh, being really angry to not wanting to talk at times, is a quote at page 144 of volume two. She's and also very upset, qu quote, very yes. upset, unquote, quote, distraught, unquote, quote, tearful, unquote. Yes. But, but she's responding to very detailed questions. Is that not the case? That's, that is the case. Now, the... Um, was the defense here consent or... Lack of Con or consent. misidentification. What? It was, it was consent from was the. Not at all misidentification. No. Okay. No. There, there is. Uh, I realize the argument, uh, but what the trial counsel was doing was so showing that she could be confused as to John's. You know, even in the closing, he's saying, you know, they used high science to trap a John. So it was consistently a, cons a consent case throughout. The what was the time element between when when the the, the, the sexual event occurred and, and the report to the police? Okay, we know she left her friend Tony's. She, she told Maybe us it was, it was two and three a.m. It was a matter of hours. Then uh, the alleged so assault from the medical record is at three a.m. Then she's at the police station at 4.30 a.m. And the hospital admission is at 5.15 a.m. That's what we know. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm now confused. Are you saying that it was a miscarriage of justice for the judge to, in the absence of objection to admit this as an excited utterance? Or are you saying that it was a miscarriage of justice to permit this, albeit otherwise admissible, and the fresh complaint. I mean, I'm sorry, the first complaint. No, we're not saying it, it's admissible. We're not saying this was a spontaneous exclamation. See, ad additionally, th there's a lot more going on. But I mean, but you have on, she page, has, on page 144 of the transcript. Yes. The nurse speaking, and quote, she was very upset, she was distraught, she was tearful. She went from being really angry to not wanting to talk at times. Why is that not, why is that description of her demeanor not sufficient to support a judge's finding that this was an excited utterance in view of the, the event and the time and the fact that only t two hours had passed since the event? Why is okay. that, why is that? Because as we try to uh, allude to, and evidently not so well, she, not only from the, the prior the initial complaint, but she has three motives to fabricate, two of which exist before she got into the defendant's truck. Her excitement may be due to forgoing her prescription medications, which she knew enough, thank God, not to take while she was doing uh, the illicit substances. And they may be due to anxiety that she has knowing that she's going to have to confront her mother, whom she's left minding her children. And they may do, be due to anxiety she has, realizing that she's already under DSS scrutiny. So, so wasn't this actually the core of the defense? It was the, the impeachment material that was contained in these f first complaint, the, these statements that you say were... Uh, right, and it, that, that is also our position, that if... Um, the um, Commonwealth wanted to do anything on rehabilitation or wanted to counter the defense case, that's fine. But it's quite different when it's coming in on direct, as direct to, uh, te testimony in the Commonwealth's case in chief. But, but can't we take a look at, to see how um, the, the defense, to see whether and how the defense made use of these uh, first complaint statements, and here, 
these additional first complaint statements appear to have been used as very, a very critical part of the defense. Uh, they were used to impeach her. Yes, yes. But, but that's after they've already come in on direct. Yes, but, th but that's, what, that's what I'm saying. In other words, they should, well, not they had come in on direct. Well, that they did because the, the prosecutor asked the nurses. Yeah, to yes. Okay, but that's what we're saying. If you put in that <coughs> in as direct testimony, it has the force of direct uh, testimony and that impact on the jurors. But why was it not a, an appropriate strategic course for defense counsel here to say, I'm going to not object to allowing the excited, this statement in because I want to use it to show that she contradicted herself during the course of her various descriptions of the events? Why okay. is that not a sensible thing for defense counsel to do? Well, as we, as we look at the witnesses, why wouldn't those witnesses be available for the defense as a case in chief? All the other, the only other evidence the Commonwealth has is a mound of DNA evidence from three witnesses plus exhibits in a consent case, okay? Given that the case is sensitive to the complaint, the first complaint doctrine, as it is, we see like a high, it, it, see it, it doesn't take much in a, in, a, in a complaint case to trip up the jury, to take their eye off the ball so that they don't see the case as a credibility test. And that's not ultimately as an afterthought, it's ab initio and, and, and to the end. So on, but on the question of whether the, the, the admission of this testimony created a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice, this testimony clearly appears to be to have been a two-edged sword. Uh, and, and it didn't only come in with the upper blade, uh, you know, favoring the Commonwealth's case. It came in with the lower blade favoring the defense case. It, it, doesn't that, don't we look at that? Don't we look to see how I, the defense made use of the lower blade of this two-edged knife? Well, I, I, think, I think there's merit in enforcing the first complaint doctrine. See, that would be just, just yet another way to avoid enforcement of the doctrine or to limit it or to uh, but the standard of review is, was, it, was there a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice? Yes. Do we have any affidavit from the trial attorney? No. That no. might have been helpful. But. No. I, I. You can answer the question, and then you must please stop, Mr. Mazza. Yes, Your Honor. Th there is no affidavit from the Thank court. you. Thank you, Mr. Mazza. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Noble. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Janice Noble on behalf of the Commonwealth with me today is Assistant District Attorney Corey Flashner, the trial prosecutor in the case. This case presents the Court with an opportunity to explain and clarify the interplay between excited utterance admission and first complaint testimony in, in sexual assault cases in the Commonwealth. And it is the Commonwealth's position that excited, yes, Your Honor. It looked no. as though you were about to ask me a question. No. It's, uh, uh, well, I have a question. Sure, um, you say on page 29 of your brief, this is regarding the um, victim's mother's testimony. Yes. You say at no point did White, who's White, um, did White testify that she believed her daughter's allegations. Accordingly, this evidence was not the piling on of complaint testimony that we uh, struck down in Stuckage. But where did you get this notion that there's, that believing the allegation is something that makes um, a second or third complaint admissible. I mean inadmissible, sorry. Well, I think the court has been clear in King and in its progeny that subsequent complaints are inadmissible. But when it comes to Stuckage, I think the real holding in Stuckage and the, the purpose of Stuckage is to show that when it's the imprimatur of official belief, I think the court's concern, at least my reading, is that the sane interviewer believed the victim. Well, that, that was one little part of it, that you shouldn't have um, official people talking about taking reports because it tends to give an imprimatur of belief, but I don't think that passage in Stuckage was ever intended to mean that um, 
later complaints are admissible as long as the witness doesn't say that she believed the complainant. No, I don't believe later complaints are admissible unless they fall within one of those hearsay exceptions like an excited utterance. I'm not suggesting that a later complaint is admissible. What I am saying, though, is that the mother's testimony is certainly devoid of any details. There is no saying, I believe well, my daughter. That she, but except she, that she characterized the, the offense as a rape. What she had said was she learned from the police that her daughter had been raped. Or well, that her that's the whole alleged. question in the case is whether there's been a rape. Or rape. My daughter had been raped. What, what did the police officer say? She's not saying that her daughter told that. That comes out a little bit later in the testimony, I believe, at pages 46 and 47 of the transcript. But that's, that's the key to the whole case. I mean, the issue is whether it was rape or consensual intercourse, and she says the police told me that my daughter said she had been raped. Yes, and I don't believe that that is actually a first complaint. That's the police no, telling, telling her something. It's not her daughter. I believe a complaint is the victim telling, telling a police no. officer. Well, no, wait, 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 wait a minute. Okay, so let's get back to your first opening proposition. I don't think we have to clarify the interplay. If testimony is admissible on some legitimate basis and it's, uh, as an exception to the hair so rule, of which an excited afterwards yes. is one, then it's not first complaint. That's correct, right. Your Honor. The whole point about complaint, our complaint doctrine is it's not otherwise admissible, correct? That's, so, yes, absolutely, So once, Your Honor. if we conclude that uh, the nurse's testimony, for example, is an excited utterance, end of story, correct? Yes. It's just admissible. So we don't have to clarify anything. Uh, well, I, I respect well, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so if you turn to the mother's testimony, it's plain hearsay, cannot be admitted unless there is some exception. Now you tell me, well, it's not actually a complaint. Well, tell me on what other basis you can get it in. Well, I think the mother's testimony is really more the context, the background. No, 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 no. She's saying what, what happened. Context, background doesn't really get you over hearsay. No, what it is, Your Honor, it is unobjected to hearsay. I am, uh, okay, so it's hearsay. Yes. So you agree it violates, for, you can't come in and say it's, I mean, the, the discussion, well, this really isn't complaint testimony, is neither here nor there. Well, I, I disagree. I think really when, what the court gets offended by when it comes to complaint testimony is when the victim is saying no, 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 to no, somebody no, else, I complained. No, it, it doesn't really help if you say, well, the, the victim told the aunt who told the mother, and the mother says this is what the victim told the aunt. I mean, th that's complaint, and if it can't come in under some other exception to the hearsay rule, it shouldn't be in, period. It seems to me almost as so if this case was, just, was... So you're saying that this should not have been admitted? I'm saying that it was hearsay. I'm saying that it was admitted solely for background, contextual information. No, no, so it shouldn't have been in. It was hearsay. Should not have been in. So There's no reason for it to be in. No, you're not. Okay, so now, we look to, so now we look to whether it's a substantial risk. Correct, Your Honor. And you say it's de minimis? Absolutely, Your Honor. Except that it goes to the heart. I, I disagree. I think what she's saying, and again, I, I, I don't mean to go to keep backpedaling and saying, but it is, it's the core, it's the creating that context, that background information. No, 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 that forget the background. You, you can't. Background. The background, let me tell you the background um, witness. Let me tell you the background. You know, the, you know, he told me there was an assault and battle. You can't do that. Just can't, background can't be characterizing the crime as the indictment for which the defendant is, is facing trial. Can't ever be just background. But what this goes to, Your Honor, is simply saying, this is why I went to the hospital. It's unobjected to. If there's no I details. There's I nothing. understand it's unobjected mm -hmm. to, but, but you have to explain to me what your best case is, why it's not a substantial risk of the miscarriage of justice. Well, I think I, think I point the court to uh, Commonwealth versus Cabrew, who I think is incredibly instructive here, where the victim told a counselor that she had been raped, and then the counselor then tells her boss, and then they tell DSS. That was found to be error, but not a substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice. There were no details discussed in that. There were very similar to the case here. There were no details. There was nothing substantive. Didn't tax the jury's ability to, um, it wasn't unfair corroboration, I think is the best way to put it. I think Caber really is very analogous on this point with the victim's mother's testimony. How can you say that the victim's mother saying, the police told me my daughter was raped is background? That goes to the whole, the central issue in the case is whether the woman was raped. How yeah, can you it say is, that's sir. background? I, I only say background because this is in the very beginning of the testimony, and it was only brought out to show. It doesn't show matter whether it's in the beginning or the end. Why is it background? It's only to show how the victim's mother went to the hospital 
to pick up the victim. Why does it matter? The victim, your daughter's in the hospital. You go to the hospital. Honestly, you don't, know, you don't need to know. Nobody needs to know why. It's not at all unusual. A mother would go to the hospital if her daughter was there. I don't think it really does matter, to be honest with you. And it wasn't a very critical point in the Commonwealth's case. And it certainly wasn't background. Uh, well, the, the, in this case, the, uh, the first complaint was the alleged victim's discussion with the police officer. That's correct, Your Honor. And so then, and that, that had already come in before this came in, before the, this statement of the mother. That's correct, Your Honor. So the jury already knows that the victim, the alleged victim, has already spoken to the police officer and said she was raped. That's correct, Your Honor. Then you're going to offer the mother to say, I was called to the hospital and my daughter was all upset, and you're then having her testify to her demeanor immediately at the hospital. Yes. So I gather what you're saying then is that the juries would have understood anyway that she, how she got to the hospital without this testimony coming in. Yes, Your Honor. It's, it's cumulative at the, end, at the end of the day. I think it is cumulative of other testimony that had already been admitted. Also, doesn't she also, aren't there questions about didn't she tell you a little bit about it? Yes, she did. I mean, on, re on redirect examination, there is a question. Um, didn't, did she relay any details of the assault? And the word was assault that was used at that portion of the transcript. And the answer is yes. No details are relayed. Nothing substantive comes out of that. And I really think that Cabrew is incredibly instructive for the court on that particular matter. Going back, um, unless the court has further questions about the, the mother's testimony. Well, to the nurse? Yeah. Can we go to the nurse? Yes, absolutely. Um, can you tell me, maybe there are, uh, can you give me a, a case or cases in which a an alleged victim's responses to a series of questions by a nurse two hours after the alleged assault has come in as excited utterance? I, I cannot. I don't believe there is one. And I, I spent a good deal of time this weekend trying to find something. There is a case that is before this court on further appellate review. I believe it's being argued next month or the month after Commonwealth versus Dargan. It's an appeals court decision that I believe has um, a sane uh, same situation in there. I did find a case, it's not in the Commonwealth's brief, I did just find it yesterday, Commonwealth versus Fuller, um, where, and it's 399 Mass 678, and it's not a sane situation, but it is where excited utterances were admissible in response to questions. It wasn't police questioning, it wasn't um, a nurse's you question. Just so much that it was, the, it's what I'm, I'm really getting not to, does it have to be a nurse, but sure. it's sort of a series of specific, detailed questions some hours after the event, and, I, and I'm, I just, I'm not aware of cases in which that has been admissible as excited utterance. I could not find a case specifically on point to Your Honor's question, but the Fuller case does say that questioning. That, no, by that, whom was the questioning in the Fuller case? I, I believe it was a mother and a, and a child. Um, it wasn't a sexual assault case. It was, um, I believe it was an assault and battery case, if I'm not mistaken. I can certainly send the court a 16 l letter on that if, if you'd like. No, we, we have the sign. Um, again, it's 399 Mass 678, and that was just the in response to questioning, um, and it was not a first complaint case or anything of that nature. But what the nurse, with the excited utterances, what we have is the requirement that the victim is under the sway of an excited, exciting event, the standard requirements, and then going further within a certain time frame. This court has never held a and specific And with no opportunity frame. to fabricate. With and no other, that's correct. an adequate opportunity to fabricate. She said two hours, she's talked to other people. Um, I, I just don't see how you can say there's no opportunity to fabricate here. I believe that there is no, her mental state shows that she does not have that opportunity for reflective thought. I think that goes to Justice Botsford's question, which is often one can almost take judicial notice of the fact that when you are asked to repeat what has happened, you can become tearful, distressed, distraught. The question is, does that constitute an excited utterance? Yes, I believe it does. And even, I also, even in a case where there could have been plenty of opportunity to fabricate? I don't believe there was an opportunity here for this particular victim to fabricate. I believe that she was still completely, uh, actually at some point she said she was suicidal. Her mother testified and her mother sees her after the examination takes place and she's still suicidal, she's still acting as though she's suicidal. The, the testimony does reveal though that the victim's mental state in, the, her, I guess, um, I guess the way she put her version of events as they had occurred was at the very beginning of her meeting the sane nurse. And that's very clear in the prosecutor's initial question about her behavior. And it is on page 144 of the transcript. And it's on page 
and it says, to the best of your memory, using the medical records to refresh you, can you describe Ms. White's emotional state as you met with her to begin this examination? And then we go into, she's very upset, she's distraught. I don't have any problem with that. It's just the memory details. But let me ask you this. Let's assume, because I think it could definitely happen, that, you know, we're 24 hours later. This, this exciting event has happened. She's still distraught. She's being questioned. Would you say, well, that's okay, because, I mean, it would still be an excited utterance because she's still suicidal. She's still um, distraught. She gets tearful when the nurse is asking her questions. Would that still be all right? I, I don't think that 24 hours is reasonable, but I do think that you can be re-excited, and I believe that there is case law that you can see something that almost re-agitates, that you can still have that excited utterance and that blurting out without a reflective thought. Okay, uh, do you, what's the case for that? I, I don't have it off the top of my head. I actually cited it in another brief. I'm certainly happy to get that, get that for Your Honor. But there is cases where there is a re-excitement, and that can happen. It's whether or not there is an exciting event, and but wasn't or not that the case you're thinking of? There was an arrest for, and the yes. arrest was the, it, I think the Chief Justice wrote the case. Um, it, it was, it was um, a, 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 the arrest, we concluded, was the ex, um, event that evoked the excited utterance, not the original altercation. That's correct, Your And Honor. that's why it was held to be okay later on. But it could be a situation where you know, she sees the perpetrator in a mall, and all of a sudden that brings that back. It could re-excite her. Um, and that is exactly the case that, that I was referring to. The arrest brought but back so the excitement. So what here re re excited the victim, the complainant? The well, questions. it could have been. I don't think she ever lost that excitement first. But it could also be that questioning. The questioning of asking saying, what just happened? Can you describe it? That doesn't mean it's reflective thought and time to fabricate. Just because there's a question asked does not mean that there's time to fabricate or that there's time well, to. Oh, she's got two hours. She's got a boyfriend who isn't going to be too happy that all this happened? That there's nothing in the, in the record to suggest that she was reflective. She was in this complete state of emotional distress from the beginning when she crawls out onto Blue Hill Avenue to when she sees her mother, which is after the examination has taken place, uh, three hours, I think, after she actually gets into uh, gets into the hospital. And I think we're closer. We're under the two-hour mark. She, the assault happened around 3. She gets to the police around 4.30. She sees the same nurse around 5.15. So it's about an hour and 45 if we are getting that detailed. 3 to 5.15 is my count. It's 2 hours and 15 minutes. Uh, that the, excuse me. The assault happened sometime after 3. She gets to the police around 4. 3. She leaves Tony's house between 2 and 3. The assault happened sometime after 3. We don't have an exact clear time. But if I heard you just a minute ago correctly, you're saying the questioning can excite her. Wouldn't that just, if, that were, if that's what the rule is, there is no more first complaint because any time anybody questions an alleged victim, he or she could get re-excited and we have a whole nother series of complaints coming in, don't we? Not necessarily, Your Honor. I still think that you need to show that emotional disturbance. I think you need to show lack of time to fabricate. I don't think that's going to be the case everywhere, but if the proper foundation can be laid for an excited utterance, I don't see why that can't come in independent of the first complaint rule. I don't think the first complaint rule was meant to shield and bar the admissibility of other types of hearsay testimony that's that remain clear. admissible. That, you don't have to go there anymore. That is clear, okay? We've made that perfectly clear. Right? I, I, just to respond very briefly to that, Your Honor, I'm not sure the uh, appeals court actually agrees with that. In, well, they in don't have any alternative but to agree. <laughs> I, I, that's, uh, that's something the Commonwealth is pleased to hear, Your Honor. If the court has no further questions on the other remaining issues, I will rest on my brief. Thank you, Ms. Noble. Thank you.